The Democratic Republic of Congo is bracing for either court challenges or protests after leading opposition candidates rejected the results of the December 20 elections. The country's Electoral Commission, Osunua Seni, announced on Sunday that President Felix Tshisekedi has won his second five-year term with 73.34% of the vote. The losing candidates have rejected the results and are calling for protests. Reporter Al Katanti Stebiti Jaffa is in the eastern DRC city of Goma and he tells me people there are happy about President Shisekedi's victory because of his campaign promise to end the conflicts in the east. Here in North Kivu and in many cities of the Eastern of Democratic Republic of Congo, people are enjoying this victory. Not only members of his political party, but a lot of citizens in Eastern Congo were supporting Felix Tshisekedi. And, you know, uh, when campaigning, the President Tshisekedi was accusing Rwanda and was saying he will fight against Rwanda so that the Eastern Congo gets peace, and this is what made a lot of people in Eastern Congo, especially here in Goma, take President Tshisekedi as the best person to lead DRC in the second five years. What, what do you think uh, went wrong, Jaffa, especially for uh, Mr. Fayulu, who claimed to have won the 2018 elections? He received uh, just 5% of the vote, according to uh, Seni. I don't think there was something wrong with Mr. Fayulu this time. First of all, we must know that even in 2018, uh, there was not a Fayulu candidate. Fayulu was the candidate of the opposition. And behind him, there was Moise Katumbi, uh, Jean-Pierre Bemba, Adolfo Mozito. There was biggest politicians of Congo who were not able to participate on the election uh, regarding the problem they had with the Congolese justice and uh, the case of Jean-Pierre Bemba with the international justice. So all of those people called their members of political party to vote for Fayulu at the last election. But this time... Fayulu was himself. So Fayulu lost all the support what he got last time. That's why this time he didn't have even 10%. Of course, uh, with so many candidates, uh, the question becomes, uh, would the opposition have won if they had rallied behind a single candidate? Exactly. If opposition had only one candidate, he could maybe get more voices than President Tshisekedi, but uh, unfortunately, that's what they didn't do. We hear that Fayulu and other candidates, opposition candidates, are going to challenge the results. What should we expect? Three days ago, Moise Katumbi, via his ex account, said that he won't attack election at the constitutional courts because he's not trusting on the judge at the constitutional court. So he called on people to take their destiny on hand and push President Tshisekedi to leave because he didn't organize good election. And today, just after the proclamation, Martin Fayulu did the same. He called people to go on street and to push President Tshisekedi to reorganize good election so that Congolese people can vote their president. That was reporter Jaffa al speaking with us from Goma, the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. The Sudanese civilian leadership body called the Coordination of Civil Democratic Forces is expected to meet today, January 1st, with Rapid Support Forces RSF leader Mohamed Hamdan Daglo in Addis Ababa. The Sudan Tribune Online reports on Sunday that the group will be led by former Prime Minister Ab- Ab- Abdallah Hamdok to discuss how to protect civilians in the ongoing conflict. Suleiman Baldo is the director of Sudan Transparency and Policy Tracker. He tells me that it will be a major achievement and public relations stand for the RSF if the group is able to get concessions from the RSF. I think uh, MAT, the head of the Rapid Support Forces, will try to get a maximum of PR mileage out of the meeting to pose as a commander who is concerned about civilian protection, humanitarian access, and uh, an end to the war. This is the, the points on which uh, the civilian coalition is trying to uh, demands to Hamidi and to Al-Burhan as well. 
the civilian delegation uh, is also expected to ask Hamidi to release thousands of civilians who are detained by the Refugee Support Forces. I don't know whether the Refugee Support Forces will comply with that request, uh, but if they do, it will be a major ach achievement for the coalition and a PR stunt for the Refugee Support Forces. The fact of the matter, Refugee Support Forces uh, have been uh, a major perpetrator of human rights violation. They have been ignoring uh, international human rights and humanitarian law, causing much of the destruction and of the violations that are occurring uh, in the context uh, of the current uh, ongoing war in Sudan. In part, to a large extent, with the Sudan Armed Forces who have been involved mostly in indiscriminate uh, aerial uh, attacks on areas held by the Rebel Support Forces, with total disregard to collateral damage uh, among uh, civilians. So many efforts have been made to end the Sudan conflict. What do you expect will come out of it? I don't think the civilian delegation will uh, achieve an end to the war. This is what is expected to be the object of the discussion in the meeting between uh, Al-Burhan, the head of the Sudanese army, and uh, Himeti, the head of the rapid support forces. However, the civilian delegation is going to ask for, um, you know, civilian protection, humanitarian access, and, uh, you know, an end to the war so that a civilian-led democratic uh, transition could occur in, in the country. So in a sense, the meeting is still, is still very important, even if they don't find a, a solution to end the conflict. It's not going to end the conflict, definitely not. But it can uh, help uh, alleviate the burden and, and the uh, cost for uh, civilians from this destructive conflict. The civil uh, democratic forces have also addressed the same request to Burhan to meet with him. They have not yet received a response from the army, but they said they are in discussion with senior commanders of the Sudan Armed Forces. Thank you so much again, sir. Uh, let me say Happy New Year to you. Thank you for having me and Happy New Year to you and your listeners. Suleiman Baldo is the director of Sudan Transparency and Policy Tracker. He was speaking with us from the U.S. state of New Jersey. Somalia and the breakaway region of Somaliland have agreed to resume dialogue to resolve outstanding issues after long-running political tensions and years of dead rock. The deal signed on Friday followed two days of talks mediated by the Djibouti President Ismail Omal Gel, the first of their kind since 2020 when similar negotiations stalled. After lengthy discussions, the two sides have agreed to resume the process of talks with a focus on issues of national interest to reach a sustainable solution, said a joint statement published by the Somali presidency. The northern region has been seeking full stakeholders since claiming independence from Somalia in 1991, a move fiercely opposed by Mogadishu and not recognized internationally. Somaliland has often been seen as a beacon of stability in the chaotic Horn of Africa region, although political tensions are faced there earlier this year, spilling over into deadly violence. Under the Djibouti Pact, the two sides agreed on a roadmap for talks in 30 days as well as collaboration on security and fight against organized crime and pledged to work together on peace and stability in conflict zones. The signing of the deal was overseen by Somali President Hassan Sheikh Mohammed and the Somaliland leader Musa Bihi Abdil. Previously round, previous rounds of talks between the two sides have been held on land of between 2012 and 2020 but failed to make any headway. The Djibouti agreement was welcomed by Wakneth Gebeyehu, executive secretary of regional grouping IGAD, which Somalia joined in November. Emphasize the importance of peaceful means and dialogue in resolving difficulties and grievances in all our member states, 
he said on X, formerly Twitter. The British Embassy in Somalia also hailed the move as a vital step towards reconciliation in a post on X. Somaliland, a region of 4.5 million people with a long coastline on the Gulf of Aden, is a former British protectorate. It prints its own currency, issues its own passports, and elects its own government. But its quest for statehood has gone unrecognized, leaving it poor and isolated. Political tensions surged earlier this year, leading to deadly violence between Somaliland's forces and clan militias loyal to Somalia, which challenged the authority of the self declared republic. However, the region remains relatively stable in comparison to Somalia, one of the poorest countries on the planet which has witnessed decades of civil war and Islamist insurgency. Without you, I 